I cry a lot with films. You wouldn't think it. No. Mm -hmm. I do. Making people cry is something I've really had trouble with over the past few years of writing. It wasn't something I ever thought I'd actually achieve because I'm so cold and kind of left-brained. Or at least that's how I appear. I'm not in fact cold and well, I am left-brained. So yeah, it's an incredible skill to be able to make someone cry with your writing if you can pull it off. And I think you can. You just have to go about it the right way. You have to come at it from the right angle and don't just try and do it cheap and cheerful because it won't work. So in this video, I'm gonna show you a few things that have worked for me in making readers cry because I have managed that. So I'll get into it. So first of all, let me give you a big mistake that people make when they're trying to make their readers cry and that is relying too much on subject matter. So people think that by piling misery onto a character or giving them a horrendous, tragic backstory that that's gonna make people sit and ugly cry. But in actual fact, I think a lot of the time people are desensitized to that kind of thing. We see so much horrendous horror in the news now that it's gonna take more than just a situation to make your reader feel like they wanna cry. So as writers, we need to move past that. We need to move beyond that. We need to take the story from the page and put it into the reader's mind or their emotional mind or their heart or wherever it is that emotions are kept. Emotions are kept in the emotion shed. A good rule of thumb to remember is that emotion comes from people rather than situations. So just bear that in mind and make sure you're focusing on the human aspect of what's happening, not just the circumstances. So it's possible to make readers cry with really short works. Definitely, if you think about for sale, baby shoes, never worn, that carries great emotional impact even if it doesn't make you cry. But for this, I'm gonna focus really on techniques that you can achieve through a longer piece of work like a novel or a novella, something like that. And also, obviously, we're focusing on writing fiction, um, specifically the written word for novels, before you start telling me that the opening sequence of Up made you cry in the first two minutes. Because I know, I know, I know with Up. Getting around to why I'm here. So the best way to make readers cry that I've found or the route towards making readers cry that I've found is building attachment. So that's attachment to your character and the story that the things that are happening to them. The key to making your reader build attachment with your characters is in characterization. I did make a video briefly about characterization in small moments if you want to catch that one. But without characterization, without a character that feels totally real, it's going to be really difficult to make people have that level of emotional investment where they'll want to cry when something bad happens or something good happens to your character. So another mistake people make is they make their characters too good. They're too morally perfect. They look perfect. They, are, they have brilliant abilities. They're just not real. They're just flawless gods rather than flawed people and everyone is flawed, it's way easier to identify with a flawed person because you see your own flaws in them. Nobody wants to hear about what happens to a god, unless that's kind of your genre or it's like a viking thing or something. But yeah, keep them human, make them real. That's step one. Otherwise you won't build attachment to your characters at all. Once you've built that attachment, then great emotion, specifically sadness, lies in endings. Now I don't mean like chapter endings or the ending of your book or the ending of your story. I don't mean literal endings in the work in that sense. What I mean is stuff like the last time you ever saw your best friend from childhood. Locking the door of your empty house never to come back again. Taking your dog to the vet and having to leave without them. I'll stop, but you see what I mean though? Endings force through these emotions because it's something that's outside of the reader's control they can't do anything about it. It's a sad situation that they don't want to see happen, yet they know it's inevitable. If you can make your readers feel for your characters in that way, through building attachment and then hitting them with an ending, boom, tears. Got them. Maybe, hopefully. I mean, everyone's different, so it's so hard to make some people cry, and it's really easy to make other people cry. I cry a lot with films. You wouldn't think it. No. Mm. I do. Another big thing that can make people cry, which has a bit more of a surprise factor to it. I don't know what that is, surprise factor. I'm revealing a surprise. Yeah, anyway, is something I call inversion of character. So it's setting up a character to be something for an entire novel or a series if you want to really go for it. 
and then revealing them to be something entirely different. This really has to be done well though. It can't just be a flip-flop thing. You have to set clues throughout your entire journey that so that when the character changes or when the situation changes, our viewpoint of the character changes, it has to make sense because if it doesn't make sense, if it's just a flip-flop, you're gonna really annoy people and it's not gonna be believable, it's not gonna be relatable, it definitely isn't gonna make people cry, it's gonna make people roll their eyes. So as long as you do it well, it works. So here's what I mean a little bit more then. So if you set up a character to be kind of like a curmudgeon or kind of grumpy or even worse like evil, but I'd be careful making a full on evil character turn. You could do it, but make sure you do it well. Giving them this whole character of being evil or whatever for an entire series or entire book and then slowly turning the situation when the story requires it and showing that there is a reason why they were like that. They had something internally that was holding them back or something plot driven which is even better really. Some reason they couldn't be outwardly emotional or outwardly kind or welcoming to other characters. Especially if they can make some kind of sacrifice that always helps because it leaves people thinking if only that that wasn't there everything would have been okay and that feeling of oh you've just missed this opportunity or everything could have been okay and we've just missed it and he was okay all along i suppose an example of this do i really need to give spoiler alerts for, it's been like 13 years i'm gonna do it anyway if you've never read the harry potter series and you intend to or you've never seen the movies and you intend to read them, don't watch the movies first, preference. Yeah, if you've never seen them and you intend to, skip forward a little bit until I frantically wave because uh, I'm gonna spoil it. So, skip. Severus Snape would be a great example of this. He has this character arc where we think he's evil the whole way through, but they, JK did actually set out reasons why he is the way he is, and she did set out a decent turning so that when it all flipped, you weren't pissed off. You were like, oh, that makes sense. There's clues all the way through it. That kind of situation, there you go. There you go, that's for the people that skipped. I'm not crazy. So that's got depth. That kind of inversion can really make the reader feel unseated because in the same way that you've built attachment to a nice character and then something bad happens to them, you've built, in, you've built attachment in a nasty character too. It's just not feelings of fondness that you're that your attachment is based on. It might be feelings of, you know, resentment or whatever, but either way you've conditioned your reader to feel one way about a character for this entire story, and you, you know, you might hate them. Then when the author turns the situation on its head, and you see that there's reasons why they were like that the entire time, not only does it surprise you and unseat you, it can even make you feel guilty for feeling that way. Like, oh, I should have seen it. I should have seen it. That's the way he was because of that. So that's another way that you can make readers potentially cry or it's a route to pulling strong emotion from your reader. So obviously how you actually write the emotional scenes or the emotional parts of your book has a massive impact on whether people are going to cry or not. If it's written badly, tears ain't going to come, they're not going to come. It's going to be like a desert, nothing. You've heard of show, don't tell, obviously. Generally, good advice. Generally, not always, but most of the time it's good advice. Definitely the case for emotional writing or making people cry. So to show you how it's relevant, let's look at the same situation twice with two different ways of saying it, if that makes sense. So first way, an old man has a dog and one day the dog dies. The scenario is sad, absolutely, but the writing isn't, doesn't stir that much emotion in you. When you sit and think about it, yeah, it gets sadder as, you, as it goes through your mind, as you absorb it. But as a writer, you shouldn't make your reader go and sit and think about something to feel the emotion. You need to pull that from them yourself. You need to actively make that happen rather than just hoping it absorbs and eventually comes out. So what's another way of saying that whole thing that might be more impactful? An old man sits at his kitchen table, turning a collar in his hands. He doesn't notice it's been getting dark for a while. Beside his chair, an empty dog bed. One of those is way sadder than the other and it all just comes down to how it's written. And one thing that's worked for me over my few books that I've made that have made people cry and they message me to say that they're crying and I don't know how to respond to it. Yeah, one of the things that's worked for me is a kind of, not passive exactly, but a detached viewpoint on what's going on. Sometimes just saying, and a character is crying and they cried and they sat and cried 
not quite saying that explicitly and talking around that can have more of an impact than just straight up playing it down the middle. So show your character wiping their eyes or putting their head in their hands or something like that. You don't have to say that they were actually crying to, to get the message across. Readers aren't stupid, they'll get it, they'll understand. Readers' imagination will fill in the blanks, so don't underestimate their imagination. I know you've got this vision in your head and you're a writer and you want to make it perfect just as you said, but readers are always going to fill it in with what they want and what they want is a route straight into their emotional brain. So let them do what they want with it. Don't over explain and it's way more likely to carry an impact. I think the reason this not quite saying they're crying but they really are thing works so well is because it's a reflection of real life. When people cry a lot of the time in real life, they won't show it, they'll try and hide it or they'll turn away or whatever. It's because people, for whatever reason, I suppose it's vulnerability really, don't like to be seen to be crying, especially in public places, that kind of thing. So by you, the reader, saying it but not explicitly saying it, what you're really doing is echoing that that function, that social kind of, I'm going to cry but I'm going to cover it. And I think what that does for the reader then is, is makes them feel that similar level of discomfort from when it's happened to them before. They empathise with the character as if the character's hiding it themselves, and maybe they are. But it shows that something of that same intangible quality of trying to hide it rather than just being open about it that makes it more emotional somehow. I feel like I've done an absolutely terrible job of explaining that, but hopefully you can take something from it. So the last big tip I have, similar to inversion of character that we looked at before, is inversion of small character emotion. Now you're probably thinking, what is that sentence? What does that even mean? I don't even understand the words that you just said. It makes no sense. I'm with you, I get that. Let me explain a little bit further. For an example of that, imagine two people in love, but for whatever reason, they can't be together. They're on a beach, talking, and this is the last time they're ever gonna see each other, ever. No going back. It's a really sad situation. And to show those characters crying, you kind of expect it so it doesn't really add much. Instead, what you can do is invert that small emotion so that it's a little bit more surprising, it's a little more, more interesting. So while these two characters are walking away from each other, if one looks back over their shoulder and you show them crying, yeah, okay, fine, whatever, you wouldn't really think much about it. But what if when they look back over their shoulder, they have the tiniest sad smile while there's tears coming down their face? That inversion of taking what should be a happy emotion or a happy facial expression and applying it to a sad situation carries way more depth than just someone crying when they're sad. I don't know why it works. I can't understand the psychology behind it. Maybe more intelligent people or more educated people can, but to show someone smiling sadly carries way more weight than just someone crying. So that's just a small technical thing that you can add in just to carry a little bit more weight. It's also good characterization, so. Now, of all the points that I've gone over, characterization is your key one here. I can't stress enough that your characters have to feel real. If they don't, you'll never get that attachment from your reader. You won't be able to invert their character because nobody will care what their character is, and maybe your the character won't even be consistent enough that you can do that. And then how you write it won't matter because no one cares about the character. And then inverting a small emotion in them, people aren't even going to notice it. So make sure you've got your characters down. That's the best thing I could say. Again, plug in my own video. It's probably down there by now. It'll be in the description anyway, somewhere. But use those small moments, like I said in that video. Build a real person. Make it real. That's my top tip for making readers cry. Honestly, I found this video really hard to make because it's one of those things that as you get better at it, not to toot my own horn, you do get a sense of what's going to work and what isn't. If you happen to have a story where you think that's probably going to make people cry, great. You know, if you can build up to that, apply all these tips, it should work for you. But don't go at it with the sole intention to do that because you might end up writing misery fiction and a lot of the time it doesn't work unless you just have a terrible day and then you just read one piece of misery and ugly cry all over the place. If this has been useful or if you've taken anything at all from this incoherent rambling, thanks so much for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more writing related videos. They're posted every Sunday and Wednesday. They're posted. I post them every Sunday and Wednesday. No one else does. Um, hit the thumbs up if you'd be so kind and um, leave me a comment to say if you agree with me, that'd be nice. Or if you disagree with me, that's also good too. I like discussion. I like to build a community. So thanks very much for watching. Yeah, see ya.